and welcome everyone. Thank you, Andy. Hello and welcome everyone. This is Caleb from TAS at the National Rural Health Resource Center. This is our August Flex Virtual Knowledge Group webinar, and we are focusing today's conversation on um, closing out your Flex grant. So it's a little different for for everyone and anyone who's participated in the Flex program up to this point. And this will be the first time the Flex grant is actually closed out. It's been a continuation up to this point. Um, so that means a couple different things. But um, as Soleil uh, Barry from the uh, public health analyst from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy will uh, will help us understand and discuss a little bit. Uh, there's not a ton of differences, but those those differences are important, and they, the grant needs to be closed out a specific way. As well as uh, Pody Petway, uh, Grant Management Specialist from the uh, Division of Grants Management and Operations is joining us today, as well as Lynette Dixon from the North Dakota School of Medicine, so from the North Dakota Flex Program. So we're excited to have everyone join us for our conversation. So as everyone joins the joins the webinar, we are muted by default. So star two will unmute your line. And we will let Andy put up the polling question so we can make sure we offer um, webinars that are helpful, beneficial, and um, educational for you guys. So whenever you're ready, Andy. All right. Thank you. And please take a moment to complete the polling question so we can um, make sure we're providing education that's beneficial and relevant for you guys, as well as we'll, we'll complete these once more at the end to, to see um, if there are any changes in those. And Soleil, can I can I have you say something so I can make sure I can hear you? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Good afternoon. How are you today? I am doing wonderful. Thank you, Flex Team, for having me over. And um, we hope that we make this uh, session uh, interactive and fun as much as the session can be. But Feel free to ask us any questions. Um, Cody, um, the GMS, and I will be on the line. And just to um, kind of introduce myself briefly for some of y'all, for some of you that don't know uh, me, my name is Saleh Barry. I am the project coordinator for the SHIP program. And joining me um, from HRSA will be Cody Iwe, who is the uh, also the lead GMS for SHIP. However, a lot of the closeout process is um, very similar, and we'll be able to provide some sort of, uh, and we'll be able to provide guidance on how to do so, as well as just general questions that we may ask that you 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 have. And looking at the polls, I know that there's a lot of unfamiliarity, and it's okay. We just really, um, we, I will tell you this now. Most of the um, uh, tips that we're giving today are very much uh, things that you've already done or are very familiar with. So it's just putting it together. So I guarantee you that you've actually already done some of this already. Um, so hopefully that will lessen some of the um, trepidation or um, fear of grant closeout. Um, Kayla, do you have anything else you want me to, uh, to, um, to add before I start our session? Not that I can think of, just an encouragement for for participants to dial in to the webinar and unmute their lines so you can ask questions and um, and have interaction as, as those of you who participated in the virtual knowledge group calls up to this point know we we really like to have these interactive and much more discussion based than presentation based and and we do that intentionally we we don't ask our presenters and quotes to to bring slides or any presentation we really want these to be interactive and discussion based so you guys as participants can um, can help drive the conversation so uh, just that play and then the rest um, I'll, I'll kick it back to you and then we do have both Pody and 
uh, Lynette on the line. So whenever you guys are ready, um, we can keep the conversation going. Perfect. So what I'll um, go over, and, and Cody will chime in as uh, needed, is first just kind of cover what the grant closeout process is and, and touch briefly on that uh, no-cost extension, also known as NCE. I'll kind of give you some tips and pointers on what you, uh, what to expect, the deliverables um, that are due, or what you need to um, submit to HRSA, and the things that you need to do for EHB. Again, this is just general, so feel free to ask questions, and I'm sure the task team will let me know um, so I can address them as they come up. The second part is just sort of touch, um, Cody's going to touch briefly on just, you know, some of the FFR um, pieces that you have to complete and a little bit on the new cycle for the cooperative agreement. And we'll try to kind of wrap up with some things to remember and uh, handing it over either uh, addressing some questions and or uh, having Lynette come um, explain her experience. So like. Caleb said is very interactive, but we'll start off briefly um, by saying that um, what Portia and I really want to uh, really sort of convey here is one to really check in with your project officer and with your GM and, and with your GMS for some of these very detailed questions, uh, very specific detailed questions. We can answer some of them, but if they're very specific, you might need to um, tap them. The other piece is to really remember what grant or cooperative agreement you're um, working with. So when I say grant, I'm specifically talking about the flex grant program that is uh, wrapping up. Um, that should be finished on August 31st. Uh, all those activities and uh, SFRs and financial documents that go uh, that align with that, that's one um, piece that you have to track. And the other piece also has to deal with the cooperative agreement, which is uh, the new program, the new cycle, which pertains to the new cycle. So if you have a deliverable for the grant, or if I'm referring to the grant, I'm really referring to the flex piece, the flex grant, and if I'm specifically addressing the cooperative agreement or any deliverables that are due for that, make sure that you're specifically looking into the, um, that cooperative agreement piece. So keep that in uh, mind as we're going. So just briefly, when I say closeout, this is just a process that you're going through with HRSA to ensure that all your reports are done, your allowable costs have been determined, and um, to make sure that your parent, your payments have been arranged, uh, have been um, extended, or if, if funds need to be refunded. Now, part of the closeout process is dealing, um, some of you guys have, had, have requested a no-cost extension. Um, that is basically when you're requesting extension of activities from the flex grant to continue so however many months that you guys have um, requested and that in, um, specifically is saying I need I, I you know I have some unspent on, on obligated amounts that haven't been used up yet and I need to continue my activities for the grant uh, for a certain um, period of time and uh, once that is approved, that does have some implications on some of your documents that you have to submit. Specifically, it has to um, do with your FFR, your financial, your annual financial reporting. What that means is you, you will be turning in a uh, uh, an annual financial report a little bit later, depending on the due date, uh, depending on the extension date. Um, at a later time. So know what that extension date time is. When you get your notice of award approving you for a no-cost extension, you will see when your um, FFR for the flex grant is due. All right? So this can get a little complicated if you um, apply for a full year because you might be dealing with an FFR from the flex grant and then the FFR for the cooperative agreement. So if I'm uh, to make sure I'm actually, uh, you, you guys are understanding me, I want to make sure you, you, you see that you might be de dealing with two different FFRs depending on the date that you have. Is, is that clear so far? And this actually has to do, this is specifically to those that have applied and pending their uh, approval, then uh, no cost extension, their F, their N, the NCE. If you did not apply 
for a no-cost extension, you uh, will be going through the grant closeout process. And the grant closeout process is really, um, on your end, what you're going to be doing, some of the uh, responsibilities on the grantees is, you know, liquidating all your ba um, obligated balances, you're still going to be submitting your um, NL, your FFR, and that information should be on your EHB. Your quarter your quarterly FFR to PMS is also due, and you also need to submit your um, any reports that are due um, uh, for the program. Regardless of if you have a no cost extension or not, you have to submit your PIM. That is not going to change in terms of due date. But talk to your um, project officer if you have other deliverables, because that might shift depending on your, uh, depending on if you get a no-cost extension or not. Okay. One of the pieces I do want to highlight here is what do you need to do when, um, when you're going through a uh, no-cost extension? The first thing is make sure your uh, EHB is updated for contact, especially your FRA, that's your finance people, and your programmatic people. So make sure the emails are updated, the phone numbers are updated, they have the right authority, they are able to receive notifications from EHB. Why? Because HRSA does all communication with closeouts through EHB. So if they need information from you, they're going to, uh, they're going to send you an email. If it's not even coming from your project officer, it's coming from a, another team within uh, um, our financial division that's going to be sending you emails to say this needs to be addressed. So please make sure you have your um, contact updated. Second is making sure that your um, FFR, you have, uh, you, when you're doing your FFR, that you have correctly documented all your disbursements. Uh, make sure you dis you reconcile your uh, your disbursements with your reporting on with PIM. Your, excuse me. You have made sure your final FSR is reconciled with the disbursements report on your PMS report. If you have specific questions on what I mean um, about that, Cody is going to be able to provide some guidance on that. If you need to return money. You also need to let your GMS know so that they can um, make, so that they are aware that your SSR includes money that needs to be returned for the year that, uh, for the uh, flex grant. Third piece is you must retain all your records for up to three years after submitting your final um, SSR. So keep it with you. Um, and when I'm talking about your records, I'm talking about your, uh, especially your financial and your sub um, receipt um, information records. Keep that for you. Uh, keep that for up to three years. That's a huge part of the responsibility on your end. But those are sort of the key critical pieces to go through. Just to reiterate, update your um, EHB um, contact. Make sure your FFRs are up, um, uh, reflect your your uh, Make sure your annual SSRs reflect the amount of money that you've already spent. Reconcile that information with your PMS account and keep all your records for up to three years. Those are sort of the key pieces. Now, I'm going to see if Cody is on the line to address any information that I've missed in terms of just um, on the financial piece or even on the news cycle, what people expect. But before I turn it over to Cody, does anybody have any questions from a programmatic standpoint in terms of what, to, uh, what you need to do? Your reminder, star two will unmute your line to ask Soleil if you have any questions on the program side of things. We have one person typing in today. Oh, just a thank you. And Cody, if you're on star two, we'll unmute your line. 
Good. So while that person is typing up, I did have um, a thought that just um, I mentioned. So one of the pieces from a program standpoint that you want to also ensure, if you have deliverables for the project period, things like quarterly reports or um, uh, other submissions, your NCC, that aren't completed, um, it could be that it was delayed or it could be had um, been missed for whatever reason or, you know, a glitch with EHB. Please let your project officer know because we can't leave them outstanding, even if they had been turned in. Make sure all your deliverables and submissions that are required for the program are up to date and it says processed and submitted. If it hasn't, send an email to your um, project officer to uh, let them know so that we can put in a ticket for that and take that out. Uh, HRSA cannot close your grants, cannot close down your grants if you have any outstanding programmatic or financial reporting due. Uh, with that, I'm going to wait for the question to be asked. All right. Um, hearing no questions, just one thank you came into the chat box for Soleil. Uh, Cody, are you there? Star 2 will unmute your line. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, I can. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. All righty. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Cody Petway. I'm with the HIV Rural Health uh, Branch. I'm stepping in for uh, Mr. White at this time. Uh, just to back up some of the stuff that you already heard about the FFR submission, please make sure that your payment management account is updated to reconcile with your FFR. This is one of the major problems we run into with doing closeout or just taking in a FFR submission that you say you spent all your money on your FFR, but still we can go into payment management and see that there are funds available. So again, just make sure your quarterly reporting is up to date. You submitted all your vouchers, there's nothing outstanding, and there's no unliquidated obligations unless you're doing a no-cost extension. That was the only time you would have that on your FFR, and it wouldn't be marked final. It would be listed as uh, the funds that you still have available be listed as unliquidated obligations. Okay. Um, secondly, uh, LTE. You're doing a no-cost extension and you starting up a new program. They kind of be existing at the same time, so you don't want to be have employees one percent on your no-cost extension grants and one hundred percent on your corporate agreement grant. So to avoid that, what you would need to do is do a revised budget to lower the FTE on one of the programs for that employee. That's something that we can work with you with to give you more details if you need it. But that would be the process to avoid uh, running to, to that issue of being having an employee double dip on, double dip on both programs. Um, I believe that's it as far as what I needed to just expand on. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, ask them now. Thank you, Cody. Do we have any questions for Pody on how to make sure you're spending everything down and getting that um, tracked and, and 
mentioned, I guess, for lack of a better word. Yeah, we have any issues also with that uh, uh, 425 reporting and payment management. Please contact your payment management representative. They can give you step-by-step -step details on how to update that if you need it. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Pody. Um, any questions for Pody? So this is um, Soleil again. While people are thinking of questions, uh, we do want to also really, um, again, I know we mentioned it, but it can get so, it, it, the process can get a little convoluted, especially for those people with the no-cost extension. Um, when you're working with, theoretically, it's almost like you're working with two different programs. So make sure when you're doing your no-cost extension, you are working on activities for the FLEX grant, uh, which might be similar because of how um, the, the, the programs are set up with the cooperative agreement, uh, which of course means that you might have similar, or you, have, you might have the same uh, person associated with both uh, grant programs. And what Pody was trying to, what Pody had mentioned in terms of that FPE, you have to really watch that your FPE doesn't uh, isn't over 1.0. So if you're doing uh, a full time in uh, on the flex grant, you can't do full time on the uh, cooperative agreement because you'll be double dipping, for lack of a better word. So we know that that when we you know when you wrote the cooperative agreement it's a couple it's a couple of months ago so if that's the case where you need to adjust the FPE again this is a very it's a fairly easy process talk to your project officer let them know that you just want to do a you want to uh, let them know that you know you were on both grants and your FPE is over 1.0 and you would like to do a readjustment to, um, uh, to comply with uh, just HHS policy in general. It's okay if that was not something that we were all thinking about because it, it was a long time ago. Awesome. Thank you, Soleil. Any questions for Cody or Soleil on kind of the, the requirements, utilizing EHD? the non-cost um, non extension requirements, how to make sure you're doing that and separating that from, as Soleil said, from PIM. Um, any questions? Star 2 will unmute your line. All right. Hearing none, let's go to Lynette Dixon. From she's the associate director of the Center for Rural Health at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Um, she's here to chat with us a little bit about the the internal processes um, within the University of North Dakota and as it relates to different grants and how they close it out. And and this will be kind of the second portion of our conversation here. So um, I, I thought it would be good to hear from a FLEX program or from a program on how their internal processes, um, how, how programs go about that and how what that process looks like to ensure the um, smooth transition from, from one grant year to the other as on Friday, October August 30th, the grant, the Plex grant is, is done and closed. And when you come back to work Monday, September 2nd, the new grant, or in this case, the cooperative agreement starts. So um, thank you, Lynette, for joining us to talk a little bit about your, your guys' process and how that works on both the budgeting side as, as well as the other um, aspects within your office and star two will unmute your line. Uh, 
Are you there, Lynette? Lynette Dixon from North Dakota, are you on the line? Well, let's give her a second to, to join if she's not or to dial back in. Um, star two will unmute your line if you're um, there and not being heard. Otherwise, is anyone else on the line who's been a part of a, a grant, the um, network development grants or other grants that have been closed out? As we said earlier, the, the Flex grant has never been closed completely. It's always been a a continuation um, even when it's a competitive year. So I'm, I'm interested in anyone's experience with closing out a grant um, and then in, in essence finish, you know, starting up the next year. And as Soleil expressed, it's not totally different uh, with the Flex Grant moving forward from last year to this year. Um, in that you you have your continuing um, activities and and efforts that will continue between the end of August and the beginning of September, um, just with the added um, asterisk of closing out that grant in August and then starting up a new fresh one with new grant numbers and budgeting um, allocations and grant numbers with the new one. Hi, Caleb. This is Lynette. Hey, Lynette. How are you today? Hi. I, my fault. I was doing pound two, pound two several times. You know, <laughs> Good Lord. No worries. Oh, just my fault to remember you. two digits. Yeah, sorry. That's right. Oh, no worries. Um, well, thank you for joining us. Uh, sure, sure. I apologize for that. Uh, so a few things. Uh, just a little bit on the structure. I don't know who all is on the call as far as, you know, if they're state or university or nonprofit, but just our model, our structure within uh, our offices, um, obviously the as the PI and, and that we are responsible for monitoring and managing all the grants, the budget and, and work plans as you all are on the call. Um, but we also have internal business office that um, supports the management of all the, our different grants and contracts. And then we also have the university's grant and contract office. So just so you understand the layers we've got, which is a benefit and that can be a challenge. So what some of the things we do in, in the Flex and or any of the other projects that we do is we receive monthly what we call PI reports, so principal investigator, but monthly budget reports are printed out in, on every grant that we are responsible for in addition to, so it's just a basic uh, report on what your budget, original budget was, what's been spent to date, what's out, you know, what's available to the end of the year in each line item. And then we also get um, an FTE report, so it'll list all the names who are assigned to a particular grant and or contract. And it'll tell me that Lynette Dixon is allocated this percent FTE, which is this much this month. And it also projects out, which is really helpful, um, at the end if you, uh, if you continue as, as this is written this month, um, we get a projection on salary and benefits if it's anticipated that we would be under or over um, based on how they allocated that month. So if we were looking at a at a overage in salary or some extra dollars that we then need to utilize within operational budget, um, then we know in advance. And so we ideally can monitor on a monthly basis 
that helps us monitor our budget. So that's what we receive, which is, to me, it seems like the norm, but I know some offices don't necessarily get that from their business offices. So if you're able to do that, it's incredibly helpful so you can stay on top of it. And to be, and also, even though we get that every month for all our programs, it's still, um, Caleb and Andy had said, you know, what are your challenges? It's still a challenge to keep track of all the expenditures, FLEX especially, because FLEX is more complex than some of our other grants, and, the, and their larger grants. So to be able to monitor the expenditures in addition to the PI report. Um, what we also do is, not uh, we use an Excel spreadsheet. We being our my the team that works on Flex to attempt to also monitor, not solely trust. <laughs> not that we don't trust our grants and contracts office, but as we submit expenses and give them a fund number that it needs something needs to be charged to, you know, human error. There can be human error that something gets charged to, and we have 40 plus grants and contracts within our office, so. It's our responsibility, each team, whether it's Soarship or Flex or the others, to look at those expenses to say, well, I see that this travel actually was um, submitted for uh, SOAR, and it really should be Flex. You know, So we also try to monitor that as best as we can throughout the year, and not just at the end of the funding period, whatever grant it might be. And so looking at the PI, having a monthly report of SOAR to reflect, also be monitoring internally with our team and and knowing that there are some changes or we might have budgeted something costing three thousand dollars that it ended up only costing eighteen hundred dollars so what is the dollars that we might have available to best utilize the funding to avoid as we know it is discouraged <laughs> um, in not having some unobligated funds as much as we can um, avoid that. So so those are a few things on the finance side. The other thing that our grants or business office will do uh, to transition from you know one funding period into a new one is even if we haven't received the notice of grant award, they will set up a temporary fund number for the new year. So and then once it is official and we've gotten the, the NOGA, um, then they can transition to a a current, you know, uh, permanent year for that funding period, because that way, if you're able to, you know, begin charging whether it's salary and benefits or an expense that happens, you know, from a Friday to a Monday, you've at least set up a fund number, temporary or not, because we know those NOAs don't always come out in advance of of uh, when the funding starts sometimes, or it's just really tight. And if you wait till you got it, and the people are in the office. That's, a, I think, a tip if you don't already do that. So you're not waiting for someone, there's no holdup, that you immediately have an, a new fund number that's set um, as a temp number. So things can be charged to it. And you're, there's no gap in, in being able to uh, set and, and charge out expenses. So those are some of the things um, that I was thinking on the financial side of things. Our university grants and contracts office, as I mentioned, they issue, thank heavens, no, the FFRs. So they ultimately um, send all of those in and keep track of the deadlines for the uh, for us within our university. So that piece, I'm very grateful that they submit that. We're responsible for all the other fund um, reports and that was mentioned by Soleil. And so that that one piece, they do keep track for the entire university. Um, let's see. I some t on the activity side, as we all know, flex. You know, many of the activities do complement and and not overlap. But it, just because it's August 31st doesn't mean that some, not all, activities may end. They may continue. So uh, that, that uh, there again, setting up a separate fund number, then you're ready to roll if you're charging any kind of FTE, salary and benefits, and activity expenses from prior to August 31st to the new, you've got that fund number ready to go, so it, there sh should be less issue. 
with that. So those activities, many of them are required. You know, we require that we can utilize, we can support this activity with these expenses, but they must be completed by August 31st, which I'm sure you all do. And then we ask for um, the invoices as appropriate as much as we can long before the 31st, if at all possible. So if we've got some programs going on, we'll try to maybe have them end maybe July so that once they get their, their uh, invoice they need to invoice, they can submit it sooner rather than later because there's often delays <laughs> with, with some of the people just getting information from the rural hospitals or whatever community or consultants usually don't have trouble getting us their invoices but uh, getting that from some of the hospitals uh, depending on the program. So, so we will kind of back out things in a month ahead just to avoid delays. But ideally, they still have until, um, say, 30 days after the August date. They have to complete the activity, but they have some time to submit invoices and tracking on those um, through our internal business office, but also as project coordinators, we need to be responsible for supporting that because we know those local folks, our business office, don't they don't necessarily know the people. And we like to be the people that are communicating with our, our stakeholders, not necessarily the business office um, for, for obvious reasons. Um, let's see, so the activity side. Challenges, a couple things I've mentioned, the tracking, uh, I think they mentioned earlier, which was very good a recommendation, is making certain that your information, your points of contacts are all updated in that EHB. We've had that not with Flex, but on other grants where um, we either haven't updated or whatever was entered on the front end, and then for example, I didn't receive notifications, but it went to someone else still in the office, and 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 so that's not a good thing. So lesson learned. So that was great recommendations from you guys. And so and then also, uh, as they said earlier, just really staying in touch with that project officer or the grants manager if there's any issues or challenges. As we all know, working with Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, they're incredibly responsive and helpful. And so if any of you on the phone are new, don't be afraid of that <laughs> because um, they are always, always helpful, and it's better to stay in touch and inform them um, if you have any issues. And, and also FRHP, is, as you know, too, you know, typically we have quarterly meetings or at minimum quarterly meetings with our project officers. So if there are any challenges that you're currently uh, finding or you anticipate, uh, just keeping, uh, staying up front with them and letting them know it well in advance as best as you can uh, so that you can remedy some of those things or at least they're aware um, and they're not surprised. That I, I definitely uh, agree with what was shared earlier. Uh, on the FTE side, none, for example, in our office, we don't have any of our uh, staff that are 100% on flex. Uh, we have a number of programs that are flex or other, and so they'll have portions of FTE. I spoke to another program recently, another flex coordinator just a week or so ago, and and I just, you know, I thought that was the norm, but it didn't sound like it in that particular office, so everybody's different. And, and he said, well, that must be a nightmare to ma manage, which there's a lot to it. But again, we have an electronic system in place at the university that monitors and, and is prepared for more university auditing, so they're very careful about monitoring FTE and salary and benefits, and, and then we have to attest to that every so often also. Um, we do not, within our center, take time to you know, document electronically everything we do and how long we spent on it, a program management software of any sort. We don't do that because that would to me and my personal opinion would take up a lot of time that we need to do programs. Unfortunately, we're not required to do that. So our FTE is, is typically based on historical and best on, based on our estimate of overarching um, FTE that it takes that we're, our staff is spending on a particular project and or program funding, funding, a funding source, I guess I would say. Well, those, I think, are kind of the basic things. Um, I, I did, the one final thing is that our team, 
our flex team or other grant teams typically and if you have a team I know some of the offices are the team of one <laughs> so um, but we typically try to meet at least monthly if not uh, a couple months every six eight weeks going over the work plan working through the budget um, and so that we attempt uh, and it's not perfect to stay stay ahead of that end final dates of you know putting in PIMS and submitting our final uh, financial statements and things like that so that that we aren't hopefully surprised or we can work out uh, any options of activities if need be if we uh, have utilized a little more money or a little less money uh, than we intended than we originally budgeted so I, I think that's really important and if you're a team of one then meeting with your finance person whoever that individual might be to best monitor to say do my numbers match your numbers <laughs> so we might be monitoring our own but if you're working with your budget folks and things maybe got charged differently or wrong or haven't been processed yes you've got more than one set of eyes monitoring and managing um, that too because as I said we've got several folks looking at things and we still run into trouble so it's not certainly not perfect that's about all I can think of right now great thank you very much Lynette. Um, <clears throat> and that, that's a ton of information and a lot of a lot of suggestions do we have any questions for Lynette This is uh, Sully again. While you guys are um, uh, typing in and thinking some questions, I um, also wanted to mention everything that Lynette has mentioned is exactly what um, it, it, it is really what uh, it's the best idea, best suggestions. And um, as she mentioned, you know, just really working with your FRA team, your your finance person we know with the hospitals getting the receipts might not be easy and it's time consuming um, but when you're closing out a grant you really need to have that information so keeping that system and creating a system where you can do your checks and balances to the closeout and also being very specific about the uh, cooperative agreement when that money goes through because it could very well be the same hospitals that you're, you're you know giving money to for different activities um, so, you know, having that system set up and really thinking strategically how it could work best for you guys and how that um, should look is very much uh, recommended. And um, that, again, we cannot stress enough of that contact piece on EHB. For example, if you have done, if your um, no-cost extension is approved, you will get an email, you will get the uh, notice of uh, award, your NOA, um, via email. We won't even know when it's going to you. We can check, obviously, but um, if you did not, get, if you have, if you didn't get it, um, by the way, you, um, you have to give us time to review it. So you shouldn't have gotten it yet. Um, and if you have, great. But if you haven't, don't, don't, don't stress so much about it. We're still in the review process. But this is to say, if you don't receive your, a, no, a, a notice of award for a no-cost extension around the time the grant ends, one is check your um, EHB to make sure you are set up to get this information or, you know, it has not, and the reason why it hasn't been approved is because there were some issues with it. Maybe there was a request change or um, elements need to be added in a very quick um, period of time. So again, that contact is so incredibly important. And in case you're wondering what the timeline is in terms of a grant closeout, let's say the grant ends on the 31st of August and you're not doing a no-cost extension, the grant closeout process is a couple of months. So you will not immediately uh, just shut down the next day. It takes a few months for HRSA to go through, for the HRSA closeout team to process all that information and get back to you. You will get an official notice of award to say, that your grant has been closed completely um, within a few months. I'm not 100% sure how how, um, how much how much time is uh, in is in there, but it is at least a month and a half. And totally, if you can give them the exact timeline to expect that final um, notice uh, notice of award, it'd be great. Uh, but just to uh, say, give us time between the grant ending and when you get your official 
grant closeout notice of award? Yeah, usually within 90 days, based on uh, if there's any funds still available, if a bar is submitted and reconciled with payment and management, any outstanding reports that may be uh, due that are delinquent. So it could vary. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So um, with that, we're going to turn it back to the TAs to see if there are any questions for us. And um, we're going. Thank you. And this, this is Lynette O. Oh, I was going to answer, ask, oh, to mention one more thing that our grant our office um, receives. So once we, you know, give us a temporary fund number, then they have something set up and they're able to set the budget up for the new funding period. They will continue to provide us monthly, as I mentioned, those PI reports. You continue to get a monthly report on, say, the old grant until it's closed out. Uh, and then the new grant and or cooperative agreement. So for a few months, we'll receive two. So we can see where we're at as you begin to close out and see if there are any issues, um, you know, and, and things have been processed as, as we thought, you know, as, as the, any kind of bills or invoices or expenses are, are uh, programmed to the appropriate grant. So, and it is a little tricky even, again, in our systems, if you want to make sure that it gets, you know, if there's an expense after August 31st came in, that it actually gets um, processed for the correct grant. So it doesn't, oh, well, that's flex, which is easy for finance folks to get mixed up. And that's why when they, enter, you know, provide a temporary fund that they can use, so that we're careful as we're coding those things and processing. But then as a PI, then I get two, um, two grant reports for several months that I have to pay attention, like, okay, this is the old one. Here's where we're at, and it's looking okay, or there's an issue. Um, and then here's the new one. So that's another nice um, piece of information that we receive on a monthly basis, too. If, if you don't get that, something like that, um, it's, I would suggest requesting it if, you, if they can do that. I guess that, that's a really good point. And so you just need to be clear on your internal processes and what you're doing to, to differentiate those things. So right. I, will, I will schedule webinars, you know, once a month as my program goes, goes around, and I need to just make sure that the September 13th webinar gets allocated where it ought to to be not just where, where right. we can because sometimes right. that September webinar is a carryover or was planned to be a September webinar with the mm -hmm. you know 18 funds and that's fine but it might also mm -hmm. be the first of the 19 funds right and I think okay, you know sure. having the support on the business office is critically important. So I'm grateful for that. However, we're the program people, and we know our program, and and we know what's appropriate for which fund. And and so we have to be careful not putting relying too heavily on our finance folks to have that second set of eyes or third set of eyes, so that um, we can say, well, y yes, it was put in for flex, however, it's not the right flex, you know, so that's where you really have to still be responsible for the programs you're managing and making certain that it, it did get done appropriately by the business folks, because they're managed, like in our office, and I'm sure yours, they're managing several, they know the finances, but you know the program, and so you, right. you should be the responsible one and the person who really knows what's what, not, not just the business folks. And I, I feel it's always, as you said, great to have a have a good working relationship. So if something does come in that they have a question on, they can call, text, email, or smoke signal to you, right. and you right. can respond timely and say, "Oh yeah, that was that was for this. Thank you very much." Right. And and on we go. Right, mm -hmm. right. And they may not think to ask because they. You know, that's what I mean, where you have to double check. Not like, oh, we're going to catch you doing something wrong. It's just <laughs> making sure that, because if you wait for them to ask you a question, in our, you know, it's been our experience, they may not, because they thought, well, we got it on flex, so we're good to go. I'm on to my next thing. 
So that's we're right. monitoring that on a monthly basis, both ways, you know. Um, but absolutely have that same relationship with them as, as well as you would have with our your federal folks. Um, because in my they should be supportive. <laughs> that's that's why they're there. And they should be right. incredibly helpful. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, are, are there any other questions for for anyone, Soleil, Cody, or Lynette? I will. Uh, uh, this is Cody. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Cody. Yeah, I was just um, thinking about, I guess, a different situation we run into when we're doing closeout and you're dealing with a large organization, you're dealing with an uh, organization that has multiple programs, multiple grants, and sometimes we get a situation where the wrong grant basically is charged, and they're trying to submit the FFR, and we run into discrepancies because it's not reconciling with payment management. Uh, are there any a best practice that the grantees can use to avoid falling into that type of situation other than just paying attention to detail <laughs> I know but you know it happens a lot <laughs> so you mean on the final FFRF on your final reports yeah. or just yeah yeah I sort of Go ahead. Oh, final or or what? Or just the expenses itself, just, or on that final report? That final report, and sometimes we get situations when the grants already closed out, and we need to go back and do a correction, or um, some like a, a particular budget period. If you're doing the final one, we can adjust the final FFR, but. It seems like it happens a lot more mm -hmm. than it probably should, and it just sure. causes a lot of problems for the grantee. You know, right. Late work going back to trying to find out what happened. Mm -hmm. Well, especially if you've closed it out, I know our our, our folks would be happy if <laughs> unless there's something yeah. just crazy. But we hear about it. But um, yeah, good question. I mean, for us, similar, to, you know, really reiterating what um, you know what I shared is is that ideally monthly monitoring, you know, so so you're not surprised of expenses that are coming up, you know, as best as you can. Even if you're one one person shop, it, it's like you know, years ago when you when you actually used to have a checkbook and balance it. I mean, same thing. It's if you can monthly stay on top of it, then if it's a one expense that's off or you know you haven't collected from someone, you know now rather than six months into it or 12 months and after the fact something comes ahead that you really can't, it's a nightmare to go back, you know. I, I think being able to have um, the luxury, I hate to say luxury, but if you don't have a business office that will provide you that monthly um, or at the most every two months, but a monthly report out that you can use as a tool, um, having some kind of ghost records of your own to manage so you, you really know what's going out and what's coming in and what's unspent because it, it will, um, it can really bite you, <laughs> you know, if you're well out of a closeout period of a grant. Um, and I, I know that's not unusual. I, we have the AHEC also, and we have contracts out with our two regional AHEC offices, and their fiscal agent is a smaller, it's still a university, but it's much smaller, and they're not used to grants. And so the idea of them providing monthly reports out to our AHEC offices was, wasn't the norm, you know, and I just assumed, you know, that which is unfair. We assume because we have it here <laughs> that others do, um, but they never, that just didn't occur to them. That, and now they're doing it, but so it's not necessarily impossible. I don't think some places it's just not what they thought to do. It's not their normal practice. So I think any grantees on this call, if they don't have something like that, just to speak with your business folks and say, hey, would you be able to pull this on a monthly basis so that they can closely monitor it to avoid what you're seeing 
because we don't want to be, yeah. you know, out uh, once it's closed trying to go back and say, well, actually we owe this to somebody or we had an expense that came in and now we're trying to cover that expense. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, other than really being closely monitoring it on a more frequent basis, I think hopefully you can, you'd be less likely to never eliminate anything. I don't think, but you'd be less likely to run into that issue. That is a good practice to do, to avoid running into that situation. Right. Closely and and I think I've had... Yeah, the final report, it doesn't hurt. I don't think it would hurt, and I don't always do that. You know, I could. I haven't had an issue, but <laughs> but I should do it before I have an issue. Even the grants and contracts across campus, you know, I have asked with some of our funders um, to send me the FFR. If they're sending it in, sure, it's EHB, but they'll let me know that it's being sent. Because similar to what Saleh said, you know, if it goes into the EHB, I have no clue that they actually sent it, you know, and, and I find out later. But And it's been done. I Usually you find out if it hasn't been done, but that hasn't happened, luckily, knock on wood. <laughs> but but if, uh, if uh, you could ask your whoever does submit, if it isn't you yourself, um, that they would either CC you or something to that effect so you're aware that the right one is being submitted, you know, just to double check. And then it helps you be aware that it's been submitted since you're res ultimately responsible for it, if it's somebody else. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you, Annette. What other questions and um, clarifications do we have for Lynette? Cody or Soleil? Hearing none, I will um, just a little uh, process suggestion I have. Uh, Tracy and I were on a site visit to a, to a State Flex program not too long ago, and they, we were discussing the, you know, the cooperative agreement and getting that, you know, started, and um, they had a really neat um, solution to the, the slow process within the state of executing contracts and getting, getting the grant all started um, when September 1 hit, and I know that's something that a lot of flex programs face, where you're not really able to do anything, anything at all until... September 1, and that starts the subcontracting process, and that starts the identification of um, opportunities for for contracting and whatnot. Um, and this this flex program had um, started to identify those processes within the state and pre-write as much of the um, the request for proposals that needed to be written and talk to the, the grants and contract management people within the state as much as possible. That way, when when the notice of funding did get um, awarded or the notice of award did get released, everything was set and ready to go except for, you know, those grant numbers and things like that. So all of the pumps were primed and um, wheels were greased prior to the, the notice of award happening, and that seemed to be helpful in years past. And I know that's not always possible, but uh, it was it was a, a process improvement that I found pretty pretty interesting, and and they found pretty helpful. So um, that's another suggestion that that I've learned is just familiarize yourself with whatever state processes if it's you know, state government, your processes are going to be different than if you're a, in a small nonprofit where you, you know, or a one-person shop, as um, as Lynette said. Um, but just familiarize yourself with those processes and try to do as much as you can before um, beforehand, as much as you can, to to help um, reduce that burden of waiting for those. Um, those bureaucratic wheels to turn, because sometimes they turn slowly. If we don't have any further questions, 
I will ask Andy to put up our exit polling questions. And um, I will ask participants to take a moment to complete these polling questions. As always, we appreciate your time and participation in both the webinar as well as the, the polling questions, which help to, um, to demonstrate that, that the webinars have been helpful and beneficial. Um, following the, the webinar, we will get the recording of it posted, and um, we have some other things. But once you guys are done with these polling questions, we've got another that on the next page, so Andy, I think you can go ahead and put those up, and I will draw your attention as you complete these polling questions, which we really do appreciate. Um, we'll draw your attention to some upcoming events. The first on the list is the Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease uh, Manual or Guide webinar, which will be um, our Task 90 webinar. The date has moved, so if you have the Task 90 webinars on your calendar for the uh, second Wednesday of every month of the quarter, please note that it is Thursday, August 15th at 2 p.m., um, and we will discuss really all things COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. We've had a few webinars now, some podcasts are released, which are available on the website for your review. Um, but the COPD manual or guide will be released on that webinar. So uh, we're very excited about that. So please um, mark that on your calendars and attend. The Flex Program Management Fiscal Year 2018 PIMS and FY19 Notice of Awards Flex Program webinar hosted by FRHP is Thursday, August.